الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah alone. Wassalat wassalam ala Rasulillah. And God's blessing and peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad. This is universal Quran. We study the Quran in its interpretation and explanation or tafsir. The Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God's peace and blessing be upon him, more than 1,400 years ago. But it is truly a universal scripture for all humanity. So we study the particular incidents, the explanation of the revelation, and how to apply that to our time and our place, and how we can divide, how we can uh, derive wisdom and benefit from the Holy Quran. Now the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language and we want to preserve the study of the Quran in its original. So we have Brother Fayruz, who's actually from Singapore and he's going to recite the verses uh, in the Arabic language. And we have Bilal who is from Canada who is doing the English translation and interpretation. We're studying right now from the last juz or 30th section of the Holy Quran and today we are on Chapter 81, At-Takwir. So if you could, brother, just begin with the Arabic. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Iza shamsu kuwirat. Wa iza nujumu kadarat. وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ Thank you. Can you read the English, please? When the sun wound round and lost, and when the stars shall fall, and when the mountains shall be made to pass away, and when the pregnant she-camels shall be neglected. So Allah is beginning this surah describing the events, the celestial events which are going to happen at the Day of Judgment at the end of this world. And he said, when the sun is wound round. What does wound round mean? What does yeah. he mean by that? It, wound round or the, folded around. They describe it as a turban, folding a turban, how they would take a piece of cloth and wind it around the head. So it's a picture of the collapse and end of our sun what we depend on for our atmosphere we depend on for the heat and light we get from the sun Allah is telling us that in the future the solar system as we know it is going to be destroyed S suns and stars are going to explode uh, and is giving us a picture of the end of this world and that we are dependent on the atmosphere of our planet and as we're going to see in a later verse of this chapter, when that atmosphere is stripped away, we're going to be just like the fish who depend on the water. If you take them out of the water, they die. We're going to be as human beings without air, without the protective uh, atmosphere of our planet. So Allah is talking to us about the inevitable destruction of this world. And the s stars are going to fall. They're going to lose their brightness. Just as Stars, even we can observe with telescopes, as you see, the stars have a life cycle and they eventually can become a supernova and they can explode or they can collapse upon themselves and become denser and denser. And so this verse is talking about the collapse of those stars and that the mountains, the greatest physical objects we can observe on our own planet, will vanish like a mirage, pass away like clouds. They will have no significance. They will have no more... Uh, power because everything they had, all their greatness, was only derived from Allah's power, which He created in them. And the, the human beings, 
at the last day uh, will abandon even their most valuable possessions. So it gives an example of camels. And these camels are pregnant camels. They're about to give birth. The pregnant camel is going to give birth to a baby. They are very expensive for the Arabs. They were the most expensive possession. And after giving birth, they will have uh, an increase in their flocks, plus she will give valuable milk for the time that she has had that child. So people will be so preoccupied with saving their own souls, they'll be so worried that they will abandon even their most valuable possessions. And in this case of the Arabs, it is the camel. So these are just terrifying pictures of the Day of Judgment. Now we'll go on to verses 5 through 10, please. وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ Thank you. Bilal? And when wild beasts shall be gathered together, and when the sea shall become as blazing fire, or shall overflow, and when the soul shall be joined with their bodies, and when the female infant buried alive shall be questioned, for what sin was she killed? And when the written pages of deeds of every person shall be laid open. All of these are more images of the Day of Judgment. When the wild animals are gathered together, are herded together. This shows and that everything is gathered together before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even as uh, Al-Qatada said, one of the early scholars of the tafsir in Islam, that everything will be gathered together, even the flies will be gathered, even the minor insects will be gathered together before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, people will not be on the Day of Judgment, will not be preoccupied with the animals. Even when wild animals come into their houses or into their neighborhoods, they will not be afraid because they will only have the fear of the end of the world on their hearts. They will be so terrified of the coming judgment. They will ignore wild animals walking in the streets or walking right into their houses. And the seas will be like a blazing fire. Uh, biharu sujirat. And this term sujirat implies that it's boiling, that it maybe boils over, like when you boil water and it spills over, and so the seas may boil over from heat and flood the land, and this is a sign, perhaps this is related to the fact of the change of the atmosphere of the sun and the increase of heat boils the sea over, or it means that the sea simply overflows. In any case, it's a terrifying sign that every part of nature that we're used to is changed, and so that which used to be cool and beneficial to mankind now becomes harmful and is something to be avoided. And when the bodies are joined, with the souls are joined with their bodies. And this verse, verse 7, is very interesting and it has more than one interpretation. One, that the soul is joined to, together. The souls of those people who have passed away, who are dead, are rejoined to their bodies before the judgment. That we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a new body, like unto the body in earth, except that it's a body that is going to remain in eternity, either in heaven or in hell. Or else that the bodies, that each group of people, are sorted out according to their companions, like with like. So the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, are together. The true believers are together. Each group is together with the people who to whom they loved and to whom they were attached in this world so they will be judged together with their group they will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their group so we have to choose which group we're going to be with on the day of judgment if I want to be with those people who have success those people who will be spared the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment I should choose them as my companions today and associate with them but if I associate with people who are doing wickedness and evil and corruption in the earth those are the people with whom I will be uh, uh, resurrected on the Day of Judgment. So as the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, that whoever appears like a group of people is one of them. So we should try to be among the Muslims, to appear like them, to follow their practices which derive from the teachings of the Qur'an 
and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. And then a particular circumstance of the Arabs is pointed out in verse 8. Uh, when the innocent child, and they were usually females for the Arabs, was killed, buried alive, was asked for what sin was she killed. This was a peculiar custom of that time, but it comes from a universal human experience that people are afraid for survival. They want to survive. And in times of famine, in times of poverty, when there's very little food available, they start looking how to survive. And when a girl was born in that Arab society, said the girl is not going to protect our family and tribe. She can't carry the sword, protect us from our enemies. So they would bury young daughters alive in the earth. And so Allah is saying that when you kill your children, either by burying them alive or even if you give them something so they're aborted before their births uh, for no reason of their own, they have done no sin, they'll be asked in the Day of Judgment, why were you punished? And of course they were innocent. This shows us that the children, even the children of the unbelievers, are innocent and die in a state of innocence. They will not be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sins which they did not commit. But only those people who have reached maturity intellectually and physically will be held responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their sins. And finally, the pages of the deeds will be spread open. That deeds you have committed in this life and you have kept them secret because you don't want anybody to know what you've done. Or if you've done good deeds, for example, giving charity in secret and you concealed it because you're a humble person and do so only for the sake of Allah, yet all those deeds will be spread open. You will see them and they will be exposed you will have no secrets on the Day of Judgment. So your deeds have been recorded in books, in pages, and you will be able to see those on the Day of Judgment. No one will dispute. Nobody will deny anything that is written there because they have been recorded faithfully by Allah's angels who are watching over us. So on this Day of Judgment, uh, Allah is warning us that we have to live today properly so that we will not have anything to fear in the hereafter. Uh, if we have time, we can just read verses 11 through 14. وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ وَإِذَا الْجَحِيمُ سُعِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا أَحْضَرَتْ Can you read the English quickly for us? And when the heaven shall be stripped off and taken away from its place, and when hell fire shall be kindled to a blaze fire, and when paradise shall be brought near, and every person will know what he has brought of good and evil. So Allah is giving us further instruction about the Day of Judgment and what we, we are going to see on the Day of Judgment. When the atmosphere is actually taken away, the sun, the the atmosphere is taken away, the heavens are stripped away, and hell hellfire is set ablaze, a blazing fire, and Jannah, or paradise, is brought near to those people who are going to go into paradise. Every person will then know and realize what he has brought, what actions he has brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. Nobody can deny their deeds on that great and terrible day. Um, we're going to take a break now. And when we're back, we'll complete uh, this chapter, uh, God willing, inshallah. Which is Allahu Khairan. <laughs> Reviewing the second rule of Al Mim Al Sakina. That is the letter Mim. So if the first meme is non-vowel or sakina, followed by a voweled meme. So I will merge the first in the letter and I will pronounce them as one. min, And we spoke abundantly on the virtues of seek a refuge with Allah from the outcast Satan. Especially for the first reciter, he's got to recite it out loud. <laughs> I'm 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا جاءت الصاخة وإذا النفوس زوجت Make sure it's dhamma وإذا النو وإذا النفوس Thank you for joining us Welcome back to Universal Quran. Before the break, we are reading from chapter 81, a taqwir. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment is going to strip away the atmosphere of this earth, we're going to have Jannah or Paradise come close to the believers and hellfire will be set, set ablaze by Allah's wrath and by the sins of mankind. Everybody will realize then the reality of the deeds which they have brought forward to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, either evil or good. Now we're going to read from the next verses from 15 through 18, please. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا عَسْعَسِ وَالصُّبْحِ إِذَا تَنَفَّسِ Thank you. Can you read the English? So verily, I swear by the planets that recede, and by the planets that move swiftly and hide themselves, and by the night as it departs, and by the dawn as it brightens. Thank you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an sometimes swears an oath by some aspects of His creation. Now, we in our daily lives, and sometimes may swear an oath. And we can only swear an oath by Allah, our Creator and our Lord, because swearing an oath is an act of worship. But in the Qur'an, Allah is calling to witness these aspects of His creation which demonstrate His greatness and the truth. And so that is within Allah's power to call them in witness. But they're aspects of His creation. And so we do not swear oaths by the planets or by any other thing in the created universe, whether it's a person or any other object. So Allah says, I swear by the planets that recede. Uh, then He says, and al jawar al kunnas, those that move swiftly. The planets or stars are here being compared to an image which is familiar to the Arabs of that time, people who lived in the desert. There were the ghazals, or small animals like deer that lived in the desert and would run very, very quickly. Suddenly, if you were traveling, you would suddenly see one jump up from behind a sand dune and run swiftly. And then it would hide in its home. Maybe it has a burrow in the ground or a little place where it lives. And it would suddenly disappear. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing the movement of planets and stars and other celestial objects that move swiftly and then they disappear and recede. When the sun comes out, the light of those things disappears. Then, when the night comes, the stars reappear. The sun's light is concealed. People are covered up in darkness. This is up, as Ibn Abbas said, even until the middle of the night. And so he calls these phenomena into demonstrate to us His power, the power of the stars, the power that Allah has over the stars, the planets, the night, and the day. And then in verse 18, and the morning time when it dawns, إِذَا tanafas, just like breathing in the Arabic language. When dawn comes, you feel brightness, suddenly nice breezes blow off from the desert if you're in a hot country like where the Qur'an was originally revealed. People feel happiness. They suddenly feel a surge of pleasure when they see the sun rise and morning comes. The darkness is gone and now it's light of a new day. And people feel a positive feeling. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us these different earthly phenomena and how we enjoy them and take pleasure and notice their beauty. And we should look at the beauty of the Qur'an and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to consider every aspect of this world, no matter how insignificant, He points out to us very 
important details of those small things so that we may be brought back to faith that this book truly is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. Now we're going to read, please, verses 19 through 23. إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ مَكِينٍ مُطَاعٍ ثَمَّ أَمِينٍ وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونٍ وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينِ Thank you. Read the English, please, yeah. Very, this is the word brought by a most honorable messenger, owner of power and high rank with Allah, the Lord, Lord of the throne, obeyed, trust, trustworthy there, and your companion is not a madman, and indeed he saw him in a clear horizon. So Allah, first of all, pointed to us uh, about the signs of the day of judgment, the end of this world that this world is going to culminate at the end to the Day of Judgment where we'll be responsible for our deeds. And then shows us some of his signs of the truth of the Holy Qur'an. And then he tells us actually about the revelation or history of the revelation to the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. He said that this revelation is conveyed to us by an honorable messenger. And that is the angelic messenger Gabriel or Jibril alayhi salam, peace be upon him, according to Ibn Abbas, the great scholar of tafsir or interpretation of the Quran from among the Prophet's companions. And he pointed out that this is talking about the angel Gabriel. So the, Allah sent an angel messenger to the Prophet, and the Prophet was the human messenger to all of mankind. So this Quran was conveyed by somebody who was honorable, trustworthy who would not change one part, one word, one letter of this messenger. And the angel Gabriel is described also in verse 20. One who has power and rank there in the heavens with the Lord of the throne. He is given power over all the other angels. He is honored there. He is trustworthy. And so the one who would be honored in heaven among the angels, of course we could trust that the message given by him to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is also a trustworthy message. But people doubted. They said this message uh, is the product of a madman, one who is possessed, one who would fall into, as a, as a person who had a, a, a mental illness and would fall in, out, out of consciousness and start mumbling crazy things. But the Quran is not a mumble jumble of crazy messages. An insane person could not come up with a coherent statement, but an insane person would produce nonsense. While the Quran is full of deep, important meanings that every sincere person can examine it and be convinced of its truth and its importance and that it is not the product of insanity or magic or any of the other things that the Prophet was accused of being. In fact, he saw the angel Gabriel physically on more than one occasion. When the Qur'an was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ was meditating, praying, fasting in a grotto or cave in a mountain outside of the city of Mecca. And he was thinking about the problems of his people when the angel Gabriel first appeared to him and had him read the first verses of the Holy Qur'an. And then, as he descended from the mountain, he looked to the horizon and saw Gabriel, the angel Jibreel, in his true form with 600 wings, and he filled the whole horizon. So the Prophet ﷺ was totally mesmerized and astonished to see this angel in its true and mighty form. And it shows us that the one who conveyed this message to the Prophet Muhammad from Allah is trustworthy, but also hugely powerful and magnificent in himself. So what about the message which he was entrusted with from Allah? How important is it then that we should give it our attention. So we'll continue now from verses 24 through 26 of this chapter. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ 
وما هو بقول شيطان الرجيم فأين تذهبون Thank you. Can you read below? And he withholds not a knowledge of the unseen and it is not the word of shaitan the outcast. Then where are you going? So once again, the Quran is a universal message for all humanity, for everybody in every time and place. But this particular verse is telling us what actually happened to the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, when he tried to convey this message to his people. Uh, Allah wants to say that this man is a man whom you trusted. The people called him Al-Amin or the trustworthy and they trusted him before this message was revealed to him. So why would they not trust him now that he is conveying a message from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not withhold any knowledge of the unseen. Everything that has been vouchsafed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his revelation, he does not withhold it. So there are two ways of actually reciting this uh, uh, verse in the Arabic language. First of all, dhanin in Arabic and dhanin. And dhanin means withholding or being stingy with something. So the Prophet Muhammad was not stingy, but everything that was given to him by Allah, he conveyed to his people. So he conveyed the message. And also it means that he was not unreliable. He was not unreliable in conveying it, but he was trustworthy in conveying it. And we bear witness that he conveyed that message. It is not the word of shaitan. It was not the word of Satan or the devil. So where are you going, O people of Mecca? And all of you people today who are still following their way, why are you running away from this message instead of embracing it? It is a true message from Allah. Can you read the last verses of the chapter, please? In huwa illa dhikrun lil alameen لمن شاء منكم أن يستقيم وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله رب العالمين. Thank you. Can you read that? Verily, this is no less than a reminder to the worlds. To whomsoever among you who wills to walk straight. And you will not, unless it be that Allah wills, the Lord of the worlds. So this message is for everybody, not just the people of Arabia, not just for the Arabs, or the people of the Middle East, or the people of one country or another, but it is for everybody in the world, the humanity, and even the spirits, the jinn, the unseen spirits who share this world along with humanity. For anybody who desires to be to walk straight or to be upright, to follow the message carefully, to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we can only obey Allah if it be Allah's will. And so we ask Allah to guide us all to his religion. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخل 